This edition of the podcast covers the most recent episode of Lovecraft Country on HBO. If you haven't seen that episode yet, go and watch it and then come back and listen. That's your warning. It's Double M. Shoggoth. Surprise. <laughs> it's Catfish. Oh, God, that was horrible. <laughs> Two wonderful panelists. Double, 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 double P podcast. Double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P podcast. Welcome to Shoggoth Surprise. This is a podcast about HBO's Lovecraft Country, and we have a very, very special podcast episode for you this evening. We are talking about episode three of season one, Holy Ghost, written by Misha Green, Jonathan Ikid, and Sonia Winton, and directed by Daniel Sackheim, who has directed a bunch of things. Uh, True Detective, Better Call Saul, Ozark, The Americans, and a couple episodes of Game of Thrones, which has brought all of us here this evening together. So first of all, let's introduce our usual boring Shoggoth, and that is Matt. Matt, introduce yourself. I am very happy to be the boring one amongst this crowd. Hi, everybody. I'm Double M. Matt Murdick, thanks for joining us this time around. It's great to be part of the Double P family of podcasts. And speaking of the Double P family, we'd be nowhere without our alcoholic father, and he has joined us this evening. Double B, please introduce yourself. Well, I've got a little baby head while I play in the NBA. It's me, Double B. Double B? Bubba Braithright, I'm here to talk to you guys about Love Calf Country. You guys have been doing such a great job on the podcast these first two episodes that uh -huh. I thought to myself, I better get in here and fix this. So, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Well, let's let's see if, if you are able, either through positive, uh, but more likely negative reinforcement, if you're able to whip this podcast into shape tonight. Now, since we have the father of the Double P Broadcast Network, we need to right away beg you to reach out to us, to leave us reviews, to contact us. And Matt, what are the many ways that we want you to do that? Well, the first thing is we want you to subscribe, rate, and leave written reviews wherever you get this podcast. If you're listening to us now and you haven't left us a written review, we need it now. You can also submit feedback to the word double, the letters PHQ on Twitter and Insta. And you can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash double PHQ. The word double, the letters PHQ. If you're going to find us on YouTube, search for double P media on YouTube and leave comments there as well. Yeah. At the end of the show, we will, a uh, special treat at the end of the show, we'll give you our Twitter handles so that you can yell at us individually. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't introduce myself, and that is because I am in for verbal lashing tonight by Bubba Braithwaite. My name is Catfish. Oh, hey, Catfish. <laughs> yeah, how's it going? So before we get into breaking down the episode, we're going to talk about a few things. And as always, first, we give our ratings for tonight's episode. So far, uh, Double M. Double is, M? Yeah, Matt Murdock is going to give us his rating for tonight's episode. But just know that we have given very high ratings so far, both Matt and myself. So, Matt, what is your rating for tonight's episode? Well, the first week I went, what, 8.5. The second week I went as high as 9.5. That was last week. This week mm -hmm. I'm going right in the middle at a 9. I love a good ghost story. Uh, this reminded me of Poltergeist a lot. I loved it. Uh, and I love the extra flair of... Uh, especially Letty taking care of business out there in the street. That was great. Wow. Well, I am going to go next so that uh, our, our Lord and Master can uh, correct us at the end. I am giving tonight's episode eight what I like to call double Gs. Double Gs? Yeah. As we all know, if uh, there's something wrong in your house, it needs to be cleaned up of anything fernal or normal. You just need to bring a goat onto the uh, porch Got it. You're all set. <laughs> <laughs> Bubba, everyone yeah. has been waiting for you to show up and provide your unique perspective on this show. What did you give tonight's episode, Bubba? 
Guys, this felt like an episode of The X-Files to me. The X-Files has a lot of huge fans. And wh- why does it feel like an episode of The X-Files? Because it's, you know, it feels like it's just this episode that the monster is, is dealing with. It's almost like a monster of the week, this haunted house of the week. And yet, like in The X-Files, spoiler alert, that was kind of the ongoing storyline of the cigarette smoking man and that kind of stuff. There's still the ongoing storyline of Christina Braithwaite in what's going on, and the Book of Adam, and all this stuff. Now, the hard part is, here's where I turn out to be a real loser. I actually wasn't a huge fan of the X-Files TV show. I didn't. I tried to get into it. I couldn't. And this episode, it, it felt like I, I was at arm's length. I just couldn't connect with it. So sadly, I'm only going to give this six what I like to call triple Bs out of ooh, ten. Ooh, triple, triple Bs? Well... You know, if you've ever been to a housewarming party, a triple B is what we refer to as a bloody bathroom booty call. (laughs) And so there were moments in this that I loved. To be honest, in these first three episodes, there are always moments in all these episodes that I love. But for various reasons, I just haven't connected with it. I feel terrible because so many people love this show. And listeners, if you love this show, don't let my you know kind of lukewarm reaction to it affect you. I want you to keep loving it. I'm just going to talk about I guess my own reaction and possibly the 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 reasons why at times I feel like the show keeps me at arm's length. But now right, I love that you, you do, guys love it. Before you do that, Bubba, so this is this is gonna be interesting because I feel like there will be a lot of people who have enjoyed the first episode two episodes, but there'll be a turn for them tonight because they were expecting sort of a continuation of what we've seen so far. And this just sort of jump started us in a new direction. Mm-hmm. Even the first 10 minutes of the episodes, it was kind of unclear. Do they even remember what happened to them? I mean, we know that they, they were, for some of the incidents, they had forgotten them before. Did they forget oh, them yeah. again? So this was a big jump tonight. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So first talk about the the two episodes, the first two episodes and your issues with it. Well, once again, there are moments in these episodes that I have really loved. But I, for me, I've just been able to find it good, not great like other people have. And honestly, I think this goes a bit to writer kind of rules and things you would do as a writer. And so I, I feel terrible talking about this because when I talk about writer rules, the one thing I always think, even in my own writing, is that you should break the rules. Rules are meant to be broken. But especially at the beginning of a story... I think some of these things can help. And so why have I only found it good and not great? Well, one of the things is a lot of times you want to know your protagonist's motivations. What do they want? Uh, In musicals, you'll have a a song where the protagonist of a musical sing their desire. You know, I'm thinking of Little Mermaid. I want to be part of your world. Or, Or, you know, I know it's silly to talk about musicals in this, but it's flatly stating What is my goal? If you go to a sci-fi thing like Star Wars, Luke is always stating in that first movie what he wants. Oh, I want to go to Tashi Station and pick up power converters. I want to go to the academy and learn. I want to leave the farm. Wait, they've killed my aunt and uncle. I want to learn the ways of the Jedi. Oh, I want to rescue the princess. He's always stating it. The audience doesn't have to figure it out. And so I want to ask you guys, what what does Tick want? Well, it's clear that Tick came with the letter initially just because mm-hmm. his father was under duress and right. the, that whole that whole bit um, and it was a chance for him to reconnect with George and, and all of that. Matt, that is really good. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Catfish, did, did you have something, you know, you can kind of put in stone and this is Tick's goal? I mean, yes, in the first in the first two episodes, the goal was uh, to uh, save his father, All for right, sure. Okay. Uh, he clearly okay, has. A- he clearly there clearly are some unresolved issues he has mm-hmm. with his father, and this was a case where his father reached out to him, or at least he thought he did. You know, yeah. his father gives him a hard time. Like, how could you? How could you be such a sucker to believe that I would actually write you a nice letter? <laughs> okay, so, so Bubba, I- clearly this didn't. This either didn't come across to you, or you were looking for something deeper. What What are you looking well, for? Well, Matt, that's going to get to the next thing I want to talk about, and that is stakes as a writer. You want to give everything stakes. And so 
right, Tick is coming to to meet with his father, coming to look for his father, and then later rescue for his father. But how is uh, how could I, as an audience member, really feel like they were high stakes when it's let's go look for dad? And you know what? Let's kind of take side trips too, so we can review these things for the guide. Now, if his if we're really looking for his dad, you know. If it was urgent, if it was like, we got to find his dad, we got to rescue his dad, I think I would be able to connect with that easier as an audience member, but it's more, more like, yeah, what happened to dad? You know, I didn't really have the greatest relationship with him. Yeah, well, okay, we think he went here. Well, you know what? Let's go here and look at this thing for the guidebook. So it doesn't feel like they're okay. But okay, mistakes. to me that it felt like it felt like that was right on the way. You gotta you gotta stop right there, Bubba, because okay. what you're saying is clearly these people shouldn't stop to eat. No, no because that's not. the only thing that really. I mean, they. The goal they went was, out of the way. They they visited Letty's brother because and Letty so was going were, to they, stay there. That's where she was going to go. And then because of what happened between Marvin and Letty, I'm saying there was not a ticking clock, and it didn't feel urgent to me. I once again, I hope I it felt urgent to you guys. It did not feel urgent to me. And so then, I keep talking about stakes. This is something. There are two things within it. If people get shot and killed and then brought back to life. In the, in the second episode, it, it plays a bit with what are the stakes of this tale. And then similarly, for me, and once again, listeners, I hope you completely disagree with me. I hope everybody loves this. But then similarly, Tick, Atticus, our hero, he has so far what feels like a bit of a what I call the Harry Potter dilemma, mm. meaning that, that they kept running into problems where someone other than Tick would kind of solve the problem. Like Tick shows in that very first episode when they go to the diner and he's looking at the wall, notices it's white, and he understands and figures out, okay, why this is terrible. And so this is teaching me as an audience. Tick is really smart. He can figure these things out great. But kind of every obstacle that Tick has run into, somebody else is bailing him out. A lot of times, to be honest, so far it's been Christina with her whistle or with her car cutting off those evil sheriff who were trying to get him. Uh, In the second episode, he's saved by that vision of his ancestor, which is great. But once again, it's almost like if Tick's actions were were more proactive, I think I could connect a bit better. Now, of course, I called it a Harry Potter issue. If you watch those early, almost every early Harry Potter movie, it wasn't like Harry was doing anything heroic either. He tended to be rescued by a lot of kind of outside forces. The final thing is just the the withholding information. I understand that you want to withhold what happened to Tick in Korea, as that's something you can reveal later. But even his relationship with his father, it felt like they were holding something back there from me so that I could really understand what it emotionally meant to him. Now, once again, these are my own opinions. I hope everybody disagrees. Please feel free to write me and tell me I'm wrong. But I'm only saying what I have felt and the reason why I feel at times I've been held at arm's length. That makes sense. All right. You know, usually when we give our ratings for this evening's episode, uh, we just kind of briefly talk about, uh, before we get into it, what our feelings were about this episode. So specifically tonight, I know you mentioned that you thought it was kind of a story uh, of the week. And, Mm -hmm. um, but what, what about you, Matt? Were you, were you thrown off at all by the sort of, okay, this feels like a reset and the stakes going back down or what, what were your feelings about the, the complete kind of shift of story? Yeah, at the very beginning of the episode, I was a little bit put off, to be perfectly honest, because I'm like, wow, they're really rushing. We're not seeing any of the uh, emotion about what happened to George other than just the funeral, right? Uh, but as that got that got layered in as the episode went on, which I thought was great. So there was still connection to what had happened. And even Letty and Tick talk about things and, and that, even though everybody says we've not really talked about it. But they all do talk about it between themselves. So that all paid off for me. And I did not feel like this was just totally in, uh, you know, just stick it out there in the in the middle of the story because it was bookended, um, as uh, Bubba likes to say. I It did have very much an X-Files feel to it, but I didn't feel like the original story was uh, completely abandoned in any way either. 
Well, now I think I kind of understand. We talked about, uh, you know, one of our loyal listeners, Seth Bell, had posted on the Facebook page after episode one. He said, you know, I've heard this is an anthology, and so I'm disappointed. And and maybe what he'd heard was not that this was an anthology season to season, but essentially what this is, is is a series of eight interconnected stories. Mm. Uh, And so... I have to confess, this is why my rating was a little lower tonight, because it's clear kind of from this storyline and then also seeing on the next that this is kind of it. We have dealt with the house storyline. And as much as I enjoy kind of going thing through things quickly, uh, I do feel it makes it tough to kind of re-engage. Now, n- now that I've got my kind of head wrapped around it, maybe it will be a little bit easier and I'll enjoy, okay... Here we are in a kind of different situation, hmm. but with the continuing storyline. Uh, but to, to not have Christine show up until the end, that was a little unsettling. Well, now, wait a minute, Catfish. Don't you feel like that that was supposed to be part of the big reveal? You don't want to put the fact that she's alive still even at the beginning of the episode, do you? Well, I would say, I, I mean, I understand that's a reveal, but... I kind of wouldn't mind it because then there's the sense that we haven't abandoned the whole storyline altogether. Okay. And and I think that's what made me feel kind of adrift. If I still have the sense, okay, we're still dealing with the things that happened in the first two, and it then that's not completely forgotten as it kind of seemed to be. You know, people were actively trying to forget it and not talk about it. I think that would have helped me. Bubba, what do you what do you think about that? I actually agree with you. And when you said it, Matt, it suddenly clicked in my head and like, oh, yeah, I think I would have appreciated if they had shown it at the beginning as well. Okay. If only because, once again, it ties to the greater story and it feels like that doesn't mean we're having to, you know, kind of start over from scratch. We all know, everybody knows as soon as they come up to this house that there's going to be something scary about it, something frightening about it. But the fact that it's tied to the larger story you know, doesn't get revealed until it feels like the story of the house is over, where if it had tied in earlier, it it might have pulled me in more as a viewer to watch and see, okay, how does this tie? And, you know, maybe maybe there are no visual or Easter eggs for me to find there, but I think it it might have engaged me a bit more. I do want to say, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it so much more, but I feel like I've been so tough in, in some of the issues I've had with the show that I haven't been able to sing some of the praises that I like about the show. I really like even if I don't feel a great connection with the characters, I, you can kind of tell that these actors are really, really good and great, and they pull you in. And when we talk about the baseball scene, uh, the baseball bat scene, excuse me, you know, it feels like I could just go, you know, I could just sing its praises till the end of time. How great a scene that was. You know, once again, sadly, I am, I haven't been able to connect with it. I'm at an arm's length. Maybe it's me as a viewer putting my arm up and, and asking the show to give me more than it wants to give me, and I apologize if... That's the way I am, but that's stop the way apologizing. <laughs> it's rare. I keep wanting to hear it. Um, <laughs> so uh, that being said, I think now that w- you you know now that we have dealt with a, a a story transition and and leapt to something completely different that's also eerie, but that we know is connected to everything, maybe that will not need to be done in the future we will understand everything we're seeing is sort of part of the larger mystery and it won't leave me disconnected from the rest of the story and that's what happened tonight for me okay all right speaking of being disconnected from the story we finally have some reviews of our own about this podcast and not people constantly praising tiny oh man yeah enough (laughs) I know I can't live up. I can't live up to Tiny's legacy. Neither can I. Yeah. All right, uh, Matt. Do you want to uh, read the first uh, review someone left us? Yeah. Some- as a reminder, sorry. As a reminder, people who do leave the written reviews will be entered into a drawing to get a Funko Pop Cthulhu figure from yours truly, Catfish. Woo-hoo. Everyone who doesn't want one of those, they're adorable and frightening all in one. <laughs> well, we did get uh, some new, re- a couple of new reviews, and uh, we got some updated reviews. Some previous listeners, uh, people who had left a review, updated their review for Lovecraft Country. First, Good. thanks to Bob Shimoto, 
who yeah. on the 24th, uh, entitled Lovecraft Country, five stars still. This is the best Lovecraft Country podcast. It is so double G. Double, double G. G. It's bleep bleep good. Oh, yeah, dang. Matt, All I'm right. going to say goddamn good. We, bl- Matt, we can pull it together. Our boss is on this podcast. We're going to get fired. All right, I'm going to do the second. Review. God, I can't. I can't believe that. I I, I might I lose this salary. Okay. You might. You might get fired right now. Okay, it's a review by DJ underscore T underscore Hizzy. Yeah. Another five star review. It says mm-hmm. double P works for me. Oh, I like wow. it. Rhymes. Yeah. Such wonderful coverage of random media. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. (laughs) Random media. Love the serious tone of all the discussions. So maybe it's not listening to our podcast. The network is just like my favorite doubles. Double Ds. Double Ds. Delightfully downloadable. Oh. Bubba, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to read the next review? I would because it's a true double L. Double L. Double L. Loyal listener, Bill Kava, who is a great guy. Follow him on Twitter, Bill Kava. And Bill wrote, same Shagath, different podcast. Whoa! I love it. I love it. (laughs) Matt and Catfish do an amazing job. Well, okay, so Bill likes making jokes, too. He says, Matt and Catfish (laughs) do an amazing job of breaking it down with some awesome yucks along the way. Thanks, fellas. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Oh man, and we have I gotta read this one because it's a this is a this is an OG double L from UK across the pond, Dooley's left legs, a five yeah. star review. He said Thank trip you. triple S. Triple, triple S. S. Yeah, superlative Shoggoth surprise. Ooh. He says the latest show to be covered by Double M and Catfish is HBO's Lovecraft Country. See it is. see he knows how to write, right? You first you set the table so he knows what people <laughs> are talking about. Being a double L, of all things double P, I kind of knew what to expect formula-wise for the pod. But even this surprised me. Both their enthusiasm for and enjoyment of the show shines through brighter than Atticus during the ritual. And then he puts (laughs) a crying smiley face. This makes a change from the last show, which they covered together, Penny Dreadful City of Angels. That was great in a different way with the sarcasm and overall disdain, but without the excitement of watching a show, which also gets the emotions stirred. As always, the guys are encouraging listener interaction and make polls, ask for our thoughts, and give our differing perspectives on the show. Hilarity ensues during their comedic exchanges. But not only that, the covering the week's events, the serious topics it brings up, and thoughts about the future plot are all covered with professionalism and insight. (laughs) What podcast are you listening to? Thank you. Well, he tells you in the next one because he says, Matt's Shagath surprise voice is getting better with each attempt with encouragement and coaching from Catfish. <laughs> oh, and he's replying to a previous question, who your uh, who your first sci-fi uh, crush was. He said mine was Kelly LeBrock from mm-hmm. Weird Science. Oh, Five wow. Shoggoth-filled stars. Wow. wow. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. We got lots of other feedback, too, Catfish. Well, well let's go for it. I'm, I, I need a break after reading that glorious review. Thank you so much, Dooley's Left Legs, for that review and for this submission of three words, a three-word description for each episode. You're more than welcome to send tweets to at double PHQ, or uh, you can find, if you use the hashtag Shagath Surprise, we'll also find you. Uh, Dooley says, for the first episode, original, eventful, and music uh, with the real in the parentheses, even Cheating. Dooley's left leg likes to cheat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's great. Uh, let's see. Three words for season one, episode two, also came in from Hamlet is dead. Our good friend Hamlet is great dead. Great guy. Uh, what the hell <laughs> was the three word description for episode two? Mm-hmm. Our friend and loyal listener Double H. Double, Double H. H. Hunt Pants Holly. That's at Hunt Pants on Twitter. Uh, says that my three words are from the podcast when Catfish said, no Shoggoth Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> no Shoggoth Sherlock. Yeah, uh, Dooley's left legs. Now, this is for uh, episode two. Two. He, his three words are Atticus Trouser Snake. <laughs> <laughs> that would work for this episode, too. Good yeah, word, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he gave that episode 8.5 double Bs. Double B's? Yeah, bashed up Bentleys. Oh. All right, Bubba, get in and read some of these, some of the, some more of these glorious feedback. Well, we have some great uh, 
general feedback, I want to jump to Vernon R. Wright, who's at Vernon underscore Wright 80 on Twitter. And Vernon wrote, I shot the sheriff. Oh, so good. But I did not shoot the deputy. Well, I don't think so. Can't remember. (laughs) (laughs) He said a lot happens. He walked into many a force field door keeping pace. He's going to have to rewatch. But off the bat, he's going to give four SDs out of five. Yeah, SDs. Snake beeps. (laughs) (laughs) Snake dongs. Snake dogs. Oh, oh, Good yeah. work, Vernon. Right. We love it. Excellent. Lengthy, lengthy commentary from our friend Patman23 on Twitter. That's great guy. Uh, he does a great blog. He does writing now for, uh, was it Watchers on the Wall? Is that who he writes for? Yeah, I think he just started that up. He hasn't been doing it for years. Good work, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Are you calling him lazy because he's only just now doing it? Uh, no, he's been doing it for years. So it was <laughs> yeah, a little yeah. inside joke between Batman and I. Love you, buddy. <laughs> uh, Batman says, I'm fairly certain that the guy calling himself Adam will go with that for now. But I think Atticus referred to, referred to him as Samuel when Tick ordered everyone out. Was not a relative of Titus Braithwaite. I'm guessing at spellings i need to run on subtitles <laughs> he says I, and actually patman i can confirm that uh actually in the in the conversation and we were talking about this on dms earlier this week he actually says that he's a distant cousin to uh to titus braithwaite so that's works adam is just some rich guy whose ancestors were involved in the order of the new dawn and he was trying to inherit the mantle from titus b but was not related by blood. A reminder that William specifically said he wasn't the butler, so we shouldn't refer to him that way. Well, I mm-hmm. like referring to him as a butler. Okay. Um, William didn't seem to be part of the order of the new dawn. He wasn't seated at the dinner. He excused himself before Adam started making speeches. And my guess in the Sith Lord tradition that William was some kind of apprentice to wizard Adam. It, it always comes back to Star Wars. Yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Christina and William survived the mini apocalypse at Artem Manor because they had planned the ritual to fail. Before the ritual, Christina slipped a ring on Atticus. I assumed it was just part of the ritual, but the ring was doing something weird during hmm. the whole process, which leads me to suspect that Christina sabotaged the ritual to kill her father. I mean, that guy sucked. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the classic Sith Lord d- tradition. Sets William to inherit magical power and Christina to do the same and also inherit Adam's wealth. So the plot line of Atticus going to Artem isn't over. Atticus is still valuable to the new order of the new dawn if they want to use him. In a ritual sense, since they won't be sabotaging the effort. This explains why Christina wanted to make sure Atticus made it to Artem safely. Adam okay. implied that Atticus wasn't essential for his ritual, but clearly they wanted the benefit of the bloodline. But Christina was planning on using Atticus as a monkey wrench thrown into the machinery of her dad's plans. Man, Batman's yeah. figured it all out. Spoiler <laughs> alert on this Twitter thread. <laughs> well, Bubba, that brought a thought to mind for you, did it not? Oh, it did. And, and so... I know that on this podcast, Catfish is the book reader. He keeps pointing out interesting facts that are a value added to listeners about the book. So I love that. And because I haven't read the book, I thought, well, one thing that's odd is that we've never seen William and Christina in the same scene. And so I thought, well, you know, this is creepy, weird, uh, you know, mystical stuff. And so wouldn't it be kind of typical if they're not in the same scene, they're the same being, they're the same entity. And so that's my thought. William and Christina, same thing. They both have the same hair, that's for sure. <laughs> we did, yeah, we didn't see them together in this episode either. So there that's you go. interesting. Now we had one last, uh, we had one last tweet from uh, our, our, our listener to Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Jules at Jules Official underscore. Who I love said Jules. She's planning on watching it. Also, she asked if we'll both be tuning in to the Haunting of Bly Manor. She said if we're doing that, she'll be there. All right, Jules. Uh, I loved, loved The Haunting of Hill House. Bubba, did you see The Haunting of Hill? Did you watch The Haunting of Hill House? I have not seen it. I've heard incredible things about it. People loved that first season on Netflix. Yeah, it is amazing. Uh, The guy who directed that, who directed Hush, he directed Oculus, he directed 
the the Ouija sequel that is literally has uh, six times a higher rating on uh, Rotten Tomatoes than the original Ouija. Uh, <laughs> he is my my. He actually did the. He just directed the sequel to The Shining, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was okay. But most of the, his stuff I love, so I will be I will be watching it for sure. Well, now, Bubba, you tend to manage the whole Facebook page, correct? At, that's facebook.com slash the word double, the letters PHQ all together. For headquarters, yeah, that's exactly right. And we had a great note. One thing I do when I post the podcast there is I always like to ask a question of the week to kind of stir debate and uh, thoughts that people are talking about before I ask the sci-fi crush. This week I asked everybody, what is your favorite monster? Your favorite monster it can be a sci-fi monster, it can be a horror monster what's your favorite one we had a great note from a great podcaster himself dj tim hines who wrote that his favorite monster is drop dead fred boy is that (laughs) that's a great callback there and tim wrote second place is maurice from little monsters thank you so much tim oh man you know i'm sorry i did not answer that question but what is your favorite monster well i'm gonna say this you know, uh, there is, it's funny because it, it does relate to this. Uh, there was a, a guy who uh, recently passed away who did a few movie adaptations of some H.P. Lovecraft stories. No. Uh, his most famous one, uh, I I just read recently, was intended to be a musical, and Bubba and I self did in fact oh, see yeah. a musical version of it we with did. George Went. And what was that, Bubba? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was with Herbert West. Uh, the reason I asked that is because I remember the movie, the name of the movie that no one has ever seen, but not that movie. So now it's driving me crazy. Oh, my God. It's Herbert West. Herbert West. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll, we can keep all this in. I messed up. So most people know the movie <laughs> Reanimator. Reanimator is the movie that everybody knows based on a Lovecraft book. There Mm -hmm. is another movie that the same director did and also that same actor who is very bad (laughs) called From Beyond. It is an insane movie. And one of the 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 guy who's the uh, the scientist who's trying to connect to this power from another land actually become he grows huge and he actually grows a third eyeball that has like a tendril sticking out and then the eye looking around so for me that is the greatest monster Mm. (laughs) just because it's so freaky (laughs) we've all been there yeah we have been been. now listen go to the plastic surgeon get it taken care of so matt look you've been begging for people to go to your blog and our old loyal listener from our Game of Thrones days, the Black Kraken, went on to your a blog. Wonderful listener. And he uh, said, Did anyone notice that the evil hooded cultists in the painting look just like Bill Belichick? <laughs> <laughs> he said, Plus, they're both located in Massachusetts. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, you know what? And hold on. Remember last week in the house? What was Christina doing to Tick's room, to Letty's room? She was Spygate. <laughs> it's all perfect. Plus, they both have a very good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Matt. So we had some polls last week based we on did. some feedback that we got from Bubba. Yes. Bubba, you you had said that while uh, we had loved the quick resolution to the mansion mystery, it was too quick for you. It was. Uh, so I put a poll out there asking if things were happening too fast in episode two, because it was fast. I will say that. And actually, more people agree with you than with me. I, I thought huh. it was fantastic. Uh, okay. We had 1,200 votes on the 100K Twitter. Amazing. And uh, 58.3% said, yes, slow down some, please. And uh, we, because we'd asked, was it too fast? And only 41.7% said, no way, love it the way it is. Right. And um, Cry Havoc at Dieter von Fubar uh, said, love scenes it. need time to breathe. I don't get it. The book isn't that big. And they even cut some of the beginning of the story. I don't see what the rush is. So here's your answer tonight, uh, uh, Dieter von Fubar, is that we've got three episodes out of 10 and we've done... Two out of the eight stories. 
Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a great way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Good, excellent point. I had another poll uh, okay. saying, asking during episode two, who is Atticus's father? Mm, boy, we and, should do that poll again after this episode. We keep getting hints, don't we? Yes. Uh, and uh, 58.3% said, you know it ain't George. And 417 said, it's got to be George. That's out of, again, 1,200 votes on the 100 gay Twitter. I, I'm completely mm-hmm. befuddled by this because I don't think, I mean, I feel like the uh, someone hit me over the head with the head a sledgehammer. During the conversation between that George said, and Ty. George is Atticus's father, and when I woke up after passing out for being knocked out, when I looked in the mirror, that was etched on my forehead in reverse. George is Atticus's father. Oh, but uh, then, but then the water came down and and it, it wiped off your forehead, and then you you know you you were totally victim to be possessed. And yet, I still even even in my possessed state, I still believe. Oh, okay. it's very clear. All right. All right, well, whoo. Thank you guys so much. Such great feedback. We do not have ads, and you can tell why. And we do this (laughs) just because we love talking to you listeners. So all this feedback so much. If you want us to move it to the end because you want us to jump into the episode, let us know. But we like talking at it at the front because it feels like it encourages you guys to talk to us. We love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we love p- hearing uh, different feedback, you know, except for except for Bubba's negative Nancy feedback. But we got that in tonight in oh, person. No. Okay, well, once again, I'm going to focus on the things I loved in these episodes and in tonight's episode. All right. So tonight's episode starts off. Um, we're seeing uh, we see George's funeral. That's just um, once again we've got a, a needle drop for that. And Matt, I'm so. F- so glad you found that because I did had no idea what that was as opposed to the last couple of things. Yeah, that's um, really interesting. That was uh, Hale from uh, that was done actually part of a Nike campaign for the uh, Vogue dancer, Laomi Melandro, Melodondo, Melodonado. All three. <laughs> All three. I think it's, it's done for all three. I think uh, but based on the way you've written it, Matt, it's just simply Maldonado. <laughs> Maldonado. There it is. <laughs> oh, I've heard of that before. What? <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I don't know. I believe George is Atticus's father, and that when a word is spelled that way, it's just Maldonado. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. So we've got George's funeral. We, we don't get very much of that. No. Uh, and then we get a blackout. To a title card saying, in the summer of 1955, a group of Negro men and women moved into a house on the north side of Chicago. Ten days later, three people went missing inside the house, never to be seen again. So this is Mm. this is actually interesting because this is sort of a, you know, you you see this a lot now, especially kind of uh, found footage horror movies where you sort of get the whole uh, setup and then. Uh, you, you basically throughout all you're finding out is who are the ones that get it. So, right. <laughs> right. And the fact we're playing with the form, once again, I've been tough on this episode. I've been tough, uh, tougher on the show than you guys, but playing with the form, I think that's something you have to do if you're going to have these kind of monster of the week stories. So I liked that a lot. Yeah. And then we see, so uh, right after that, we're like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Uh, Letty is showing Ruby the new house that she's bought. Mm-hmm. And this is, um, <laughs> I mean, it almost reminded me of when uh, when I used to watch, I'm not that old, but when I used to watch reruns of the Munsters where they're living in a normal neighborhood and then their house is like, looks like it's been transported from Transylvania. I mean, this house is, <laughs> is clearly it's flashing loud and hard. I am haunted. Well, you know, on those HGTV shows, somebody always really wants to renovate and make the place their own. And so that's Letty. I love it. Good work. <laughs> yeah. She, she chose does. house t- two of the three. So she's not giving her info on how she got it. And actually, how she got the money, the way they described it here, was not the way uh, that she got it in the books. So that's you're just going to have to live with that, Bubba. Okay, good. 
However, the sort of the end result of who manipulated her into buying that house is the same. It, 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 it all is very confusing how she could afford this house, why she decided to buy in this neighborhood. She does mention the word specifically, which to me sounds like that that it is uh, a terminology that was used for people who are trying to do this. The word pioneer is used a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, in a way that sounds like that was a term that was used by people in the black community for describing like how, you know, to let's if we're going to branch out and we need to move into these neighborhoods. And so pioneer was a, a term that is well known. Letty wants them to uh, she's going to have her sister move in. Everything's going to be great. She's going to have people move in. It's going to be a boarding house. I, I was just a little confused here that her sister, who seems a little bit more realistic then Letty didn't say, "Out of you, are you out of your effing mind?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like maybe we could have had that conversation. Uh, that would have been that would have been a little bit helpful because that would have seemed a little bit more realistic. I mean, even if you say, "Okay, well, there's going to be a lot of people here. There's strength in numbers, anything," but to like kind of go over, you, you know, I mean, they they, they don't think everything's going to be fine, but they don't really have a big conversation about it. Uh, there is a little bit of mystery because the house has an elevator that seems to have a mind of its own. <laughs> oh, boy, does it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're putting that on the poll, by the way. Uh, does the elevator have issues? Look for that on the Twitter. Hashtag Shaga Surprise. <laughs> well, I mean, you could say to yourself, does the elevator have a mind of its own or does it have a mind of like the three or four people that it's already taken out? Right. Yeah, it's got a three three decapitations already, so it's got a lot of minds. Of <laughs> yeah, its own. yeah, it's, it's got a lot of minds of its own. Uh, then we're back. Uh, we're back to Hippolyta. Uh, she's thinking about George. Why do you think she's tearing pages out of the Dracula book? Well, to me, this followed the scene earlier, which showed that Tick wasn't welcome there at the house, and so both Tick and someone who's definitely not his father, Uncle George had that love of these pulpy novels. And so this is a way almost of getting back at, at him for leaving her and tick for not telling the truth. So here's something they love and they're not going to be honest with me. Then I'm not going to be honest with them. And I'm going to, I'm going to rip these pages out of Dracula, a book that they both would have loved. It's interesting because I mean, we had this conversation a little bit later on uh, when she's talking to ticks, quote unquote, father. Um, and so I, I'm still not sure if she's upset because she's not getting that information or it, it, that in such a strong way that Tick reminds her of George, uh, except for the way uh, he dries his cups. Right. And in, in, in we know that she had a great relationship with George based on that scene in the first episode. And so this has got to be very painful for her to have her husband ripped away like this. And that's the main thing that comes through, through to me. Yeah. I mean, it was actually good to see that considering what we'd seen so far. And even, uh, even D I mean, I'm not asking for people to be, uh, you know, rending their shirts and crying the whole time, but, uh, you know, except for, except for Hippolyta, uh, people, people had seemed to recover pretty good from this traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the other thing too is, you know, maybe she doesn't, people are very specific about the, the way they like their scrambled eggs. And maybe she just doesn't like the way Atticus makes scrambled eggs. That could be an issue. <laughs> so then uh, Atticus uh, sent Atticus uh, fills the room and then <laughs> he goes to his dad's, uh, Dad's place. Montrose is uh, uh, just a stand-up citizen, drunk and passed out. He's got to wake him up. They talk about uh, a story uh, George told them about him and Montrose. Mm -hmm. Ma Montr uh, he asked, Tick asked Montrose if he could stay for just a couple of nights. And, and then they they argue about whether to tell George family about really what happened. Uh, Montrose is, and, and I can see where maybe Bubba, this is where this hits you, too, because when you keep having co arguments between the two of them and you don't know sort of what the basis is for the relationship, 
then yeah. it, 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 it's it's a little bit hard to invest in because you don't know what the what those stakes are. So so in that case, I do agree with you as far as if we're going to continue between Atticus and Montrose, like help us help us out with why. I mean, we did get it. Well, we did get an explanation last week that basically Montrose used to be a happy go lucky kid, and then it sounds like Montrose's dad just just crushed his spirit. Yeah, there's something else going on. There, there, there's something also that I think actually kind of fills in some of Tick's motivation towards going out to Artem in the first place here, and that's when he comes into the place. He takes a long, long look at his mother, at that picture of her. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, uh, because Montrose had written a letter saying that he'd found something about, uh, you know, Tick's mother's ancestry. I think that intrigued him just as much to go out there as as well. Well, uh, Matt, I think once again that might just be tying into where I have these issues. Once again, I I, I use these ridiculous kind of over the top examples of somebody singing a song. You know, I want to be part of your world, and that's so important to them that they give up their fins and turn into legs. When I'm talking about the Little Mermaid or Luke, you know him, you know having such a strong want of this and that. No, I'm going to rescue the princess. I'm going to do this. Like it's it's always like the most important thing to him that. If I don't know the relationship between them, and the actor who plays Montrose, we all know is Michael Kenneth Williams, who I have such a strong affection for because of his portrayal in The Wire and in Community, and the fact that that in this show I, I don't have one, you know, I think that might be just another reason why I have an odd issue with this father-son relationship. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right. I think I understand. I understand where you're coming from. So what happens is, so th- is after they get into this fight, Atticus leaves and he shows up uh, at Letty's. Uh, they and then he says he's going to go back to Florida. Obviously, mm-hmm. she's very upset. Maybe, perhaps, you you know you know how it is, guys. Sometimes oh, no. you. <laughs> Bubba, Bubba knows. Bubba, Bubba knows. I know where this he is going, knows. and it's nowhere good. It's like the basement. Don't go there. Okay, right. so when you have a dream about somebody that you'd never had any kind of like feelings for, but you have kind of a romantic dream about them, and mm-hmm. then you wake up and you feel attracted to them all of a sudden, and it's kind of like stays with you for like half a day or so, just yeah. just oddly, and then it goes away because it's just something kind of in your dream. So Letty is still thinking about what Atticus has in his pants. So she wants him to stay. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so she wants him to stay. She's upset when he says he's going to leave. Uh and then I thought that was, that was a great scene when those guys um show up, they put the horns on the thing oh, and terrible, then Atticus, but a great scene but terrible. These no, a great scene when Atticus steps out and he's like I think I'll stay for a while. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, I want to ask you guys about this. These are two very attractive actors, uh, Journey Smollett, who plays Letty, and Jonathan Majors, who plays Tick. Even with that dream sequence in episode two, I hadn't exactly felt the sparks. I think they have a bit of chemistry in this episode, and and even though they're taking their bathroom breaks, um, do you guys feel there's a strong romance there? That Do you guys want to see these two kids together? Are you on the ship? I mean, from the very first episode, uh, before uh, Letty got the instant invite to join them on the trip, I f- it felt like there was, a, there was a spark between them before they even left the road. It, it, in my mind, uh, there was. Uh, I just feel like for him he is carrying and another thing that we don't know enough exactly about exactly right he yeah, is korea he is yeah. carrying something about having to do with korea and with the woman he, he talked to on the phone in the first mm-hmm. episode and who he quote unquote saw in his room in the second episode the one like he was it seemed like they were going to have rough sex but that's not what it turned into how do you feel about the sparks double m you feel the sparks between well, letty and tick Listen, Bubba, if I'm going to ship Wrath and Charlotte, (laughs) 
All from right, Babylon, okay, Berlin, sure. and I'm going to ship these two. That's okay. just the way it goes for me. You know, Bubba, it's funny that now, now that Matt's talking about another series, I just want you to know, we went through 10 episodes of Penny Dreadful City of Angels, completely unsure what the main mo- the motivation was for the main character of the series. <laughs> so I'm willing to Powerful. wait a few. I'm willing to wait a few episodes here. You know, okay. once you give me porridge, uh, if if then you add just a little bit of sugar, I find it delicious. Yeah. So then we get a flash day five. Uh, we have this uh, uh, the sheet being pulled off. This is a very stereotypical thing. And when it gets pulled, when we see the creature that we see before she quote unquote wakes. Quick mm-hmm. question here, guys. I yeah. assumed that that was Letty's mom. Who did you think that was? I couldn't, I didn't think that far. I think that's smarter than anything came up in my head. I was just kind of focusing on it. And this is another reason why I've been slightly tough, as I keep pointing out about these shows, is I am the biggest scaredy cat there is. I go to any horror film, I'm closing my eyes. I'm like, ugh, I I have, you don't have to give me a jump scare. I'll give you a jump scare reaction. And a lot of the, the visions and the creepy stuff in this episode I didn't have any of those kind of natural jumps within me. So I just was more like, oh, there's a monster and it. It wasn't creeping me out too much. You know, I will say this, you know, trying to pitch you to watch a completely different show than the one we're watching. The greatness of The Haunting of Hill House is that a lot of the a lot of the series is there's a large family and there's a lot of interpersonal drama between the family. So some of the greatest scares come up is when these families are engaged in conflicts and things come out of nowhere. You're you're like engaged in the drama of what's happening, the real believable drama that's happening. And then something happens and you're like, holy cow. So uh, I, I think if you are looking for more of that kind of stuff, definitely with all the free time you have, check out <laughs> 10 episodes of The Haunting of Hill House. Were you scared, Matt, when this when this uh, you know creepy thing was there under her bed and at the side of her bed when she was sleeping? How did you feel? Did you feel the creepiness that the show wanted you to have? Bubba, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that it didn't really do that much for you because it really didn't do that much for me either other than is it going to get her? Mm-hmm. And that was the only thing that happened. And when the, when the sheet came off and then there was nothing else there, uh, that was just kind of like, eh, all right. Well, well, you know, one thing that I thought that you – that you said that that made me sit and ponder for a while, Bubba, was you said to me that, you know, when everything is creepy, nothing is creepy. And that was some of the issues you had as well with the first yeah. two episodes, non-story, just as far as creepiness. So um, did how did you feel about that in tonight's episode? Because I felt like they they took their spots a little bit more in this in this episode. I agree. And I think you're right. They did. For me, for whatever reason, it's the the real life horror that gets me. Uh, the the her in the cop car tonight is what really is like. Oh dear lord, no! Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 infamous scene at the diner in episode one. It's like oh dear lord, no! And so, for some reason, the creepy monsters haven't haven't creeped me out too much. It's the it's the dread of this terrible time period and the way they were, you know, people were treated back then that has actually been the more emotional pull for me. I guess what I, what I didn't what I did said inelegantly before is a I'll try to say more elegantly here which is that like Haunting of Hill House where you're engaged for one reason and then they add this other factor, it really amps it up. Yeah. The the first episode where we had the tense moment of them getting away from the cops and then being trapped with the cops and then oh, having yeah. the horror on top of it, those to me are are a lot more powerful than the sort of stereotypical scares we got tonight. People, you know, trying to push the basement door up, blankets being pulled off people. So. And that's what I thought was kind of more powerfully done uh, in the first two episodes that was kind of lacking tonight. Speaking of that, so after that happens, uh, Letty does some uh, investigation uh, because she uh, her water heater's about to blow. When she notices steam on her window, uh, goes to open it, and uh, that's no good with the horns. 
She goes down to the basement. This house is so damn huge that it has a basement with mm-hmm. a boiler that seems more appropriate for the Outlook Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after she turns that off, uh, then she realizes there is a door even below that. And that's the door that people are pushing pushing up on. She's hearing screams. Uh, she grabs uh, Atticus. Um, once they get there, they've got there's nothing there. She tells them he hears voices. The one thing I kind of appreciate that happens throughout this episode, these guys have been through this now, so Atticus doesn't go like I mean, he sort of does a little bit. We've been through a lot, but when when the rubber hits the road, he's like, All right, tell me tell me what you what's going on and we'll try to figure this mm-hmm. out. Yeah, so, I like that um, too. Yeah, let's not let's dispense with uh you didn't see anything. They've seen enough to believe anything that happens. Uh then Atticus um uh they are talking about the noises from outside and this is where we get this is a I thought it was cleverly placed in little tease is that he says that's a te- that sort of uh psychological uh, tactic of loud noises, music, etc., like that is something that he knows from Korea, and and I don't know about you, but that made me go, what? <laughs> that's mm. it's, it's, that's um, I mean, it could be something that happens um on the front lines, but it feels more like um something that happens uh maybe uh when you have people captive or interrogated. Uh, was that was that the kind of feeling you got, or were you like, that's okay, that's it's just some information. Well, I remember that one episode of MASH, so it didn't shock me. <laughs> Catfish, I, I feel like that all that was placed there for was to be a big tease that this Korea issue is still here. Just so that they make sure, and maybe Bubba, this is a good criticism for you, but to me that felt more like a, okay, we got to mention Korea in this episode somehow. Check. Yeah. Hey, listen, you know, once again, let's stop being negative. People love listening to this show because you guys have so much passion. Matt, you gave it nine out of ten. K- give us the give us from the, the guy stuff. who's been nothing but negative. <laughs> I know. Right, I'm breaking Something, this up. Shut me up. Shut I'm me breaking, up. Yeah. I'm breaking this up right now. We, I, I think it's, it's it is definitely fine for us to have some concerns and criticisms and also enjoy it. Um, let's talk about something else happened here now. So they decide they've cleaned up the place enough that they are going to have a huge, huge ass party. Now I'm Hell not gonna yeah. I've got some feelings about this uh that we're gonna talk about in a game that we're gonna play later on. So I'm not gonna go more into about my feelings about the party. Uh but I will say that uh there are a lot of people uh drinking and Letty and and dancing and partying and there's music being played and Letty's uh going around pouring out alcohol and then we have got uh, the kids are, of course, what you do at a party, uh, you play with a Ouija board. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Brilliant idea. So, of course, at first the board's going all over the place because it's all them doing it. And then they ask, who is this? And all of a sudden it gets real. They say George, which, of course, I'm like, oh, George. What, was this George? And then, but But they're not done. Whoever is running the board is not done. They finish it by saying, is dead. Not cool, Ow. ghost. Not cool. <laughs> well, you know, they just want to let let her know that uh, he's not alone. Yeah, it's interesting because at one point someone says, where are the kids? Maybe they said they were downstairs before they played. But uh, then uh, D knocks the board down and that's it. We're done with the kids for the rest of the episode. <laughs> uh, you guys go home. Uh, come back for next week's episode, maybe. Matt, you have said you said that Hippolyta hears whispers and a door opens and she finds a very strange device and seems enchanted by it. <laughs> Out of context, what an inappropriate sentence there. <laughs> well, I just wanted to know. Um, uh, so uh, Tick is watching Letty uh, again. More to my surprise, I'm not. I want to slut shame anybody, but I couldn't be, after seeing. Uh, 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 L- Letty's sexy moves on the dance floor. Uh, I could not have been more floored by her revelation later on in the episode. Uh, some dude comes up <laughs> to Atticus and says, uh, "Hey man, do you essentially? Hey man, do you mind if I hit that?" <laughs> and he's like, uh, "But I, I hear you're staying here. Uh, I'll leave you alone. You can have it, but uh, if you want it, you better scoop it up quick." 
you know she is not an object to scoop up catfish. I look, I'm just, I'm telling you the name, I'm telling you what that dude essentially said to him. I'm translating dude speak. Tree's just kind of like, hey, if you're not going to take a chance courting this very lovely woman. There we go. Then Boy, he didn't I use this also language. There we, go. <laughs> there we go. Well, I mean, I'm trying, Matt is trying to put it in, in terms that you will be comfortable with now, Bubba. You found going to... you found my my description of it crass. I wrote Letty a note on twelve point bound paper and mailed it to her saying, Might you be interested in a long walk through Lincoln Park here on the north side of Chicago with me? Sincerely Tree. <laughs> <laughs> Glorious. All right, so Letty goes uh into the bathroom. She's all uh mm-hmm. hot and sweaty from dancing. Uh, yep. And it seems she sees somebody creepy in the mirror. Uh, and then she's right because she sees Atticus in the mirror. <laughs> oh, wow. What? I have to say, yeah. uh, let's step back a second because there was okay. something that I thought was is a quick moment but was very illuminating to me. And I wonder if they're going to follow up on it. What was that? Is that when Atticus is watching Letty dance with that guy, he got... I was afraid of what he would do. He did not look just like jealous. He looked oh yeah, furious. And oh, so yeah. I thought dark. that was yeah. that was a, just a small moment that was kind of a key to a character that he is like there's some bad stuff that's gone down obviously and that and that you know he could he mm. could do bad things. So um you know again we'll see if they follow up on that but in the bathroom it, it's nothing like that. It's just um it's just uh some hot, some hot, sweaty bathroom sex. It was. It yeah. was totally quick. Uh oh, <laughs> was it quick? Uh-oh, okay, I'll have to. I don't remember that. I mean, how long was the scene? It was, you know, tick. You know, you got to last there, buddy. Oh, okay. I see. I, I so for some reason, I it seemed long to me. But okay, that's just maybe just my. <laughs> <laughs> I was like tick. Wait a whole lot. Hold out, man. I, um, it was weird that this hour long show left. <laughs> <laughs> so um afterwards uh tick uh finds some some blood uh letty's like i'm sorry i didn't know that my period was coming he's like nah, no this it's cool it's not a big deal at all she seems more upset than he does than that but and then we've got more thing more important things to worry about about uh what what time of the month it is because what time of night it is it's the time of night when you get a cross burned on your yard Ugh. Horrific, horrible, horrible. And at this point, Letty grabs a bat and just starts breaking out the car windows. A, a lot of what she's doing is just to try to get at the the bricks that are holding down the horns. Uh, but mm-hmm. in some cases, her aim is bad, and she ends up uh, uh, putting uh, bashing parts of the car that are not anywhere close to the horn. I love the message of that. You want to do this again? You're going to end up paying for a lot more than just a broken window. No, I, I'm i just joking. Obviously, like, yeah, we'll get that out. But also, like, yeah, just uh, you attack us, we'll attack you. I, I, what was amazing was, so the guys, when Letty goes out there, they kind of arm themselves in case there's in any trouble. And as soon as they hear the police cars come, they throw their guns in the trunk of Letty's sister's car and she takes off so that they won't give the police an excuse to get into a shooting match with them. So, uh, but yeah, they just get also a completely heartbreaking moment where it's like, I'm like, what's going to happen? And they all, they get on their knees with their hands behind their back. That was, that was heartbreaking yeah, to me. That That's so horrible that, uh, that parents still have to give their kids that talk. Yeah. I mean that, that you hit it double M the, the fact that this is still, part of our reality now that the you know certain people cannot have guns where certain people can walk through the streets with guns and not get bothered i mean yeah it's horrific it, it it's it's such a, a moment for our age and so you know i always talk about the moments i love in this show as soon as letty stepped outside with the bat I, i'm all in i'm a, i'm 10 out of 10 loved it yeah it's it it it, it uh yeah the, the parallels to what is what is happening today are are frightening and very topical for sure. Then uh, we get uh, another a piece. We get we get a well kind of the first real information about this house that we already know is is troubling um, mm-hmm. is where uh, 
the cop on on the way of taking her in uh they use a very curious uh uh interrogation method interrogation technique uh and he gives her some information about the house he calls it the winthrop house uh he says that eight people uh died there in the house and he also puts a bug in her ear but also the audience's ear like who told you to buy this house right so and that and that and that's kind of what becomes important uh later on uh why why this house itself so uh when we don't see too much at the police station we don't we don't get kind of that follow up uh then we're back in the house uh itself letty starts seeing something in all the pictures, which at this right. point to me wasn't clear what she was seeing, but she puts them all together in a photo collage on the floor, and that photo collage becomes a head coming out of the floor. Bubba, how about this? Was was did you were you scared? Did you think it was cool? Were you were you like whatever that happens all the time when I don't scrub my bathtub enough? What what right. what was it? I'm like, this is why we don't develop film anymore. You just have a digital image. <laughs> it's good to go. <laughs> no, um, you, you know, I guess because I hadn't bought in, it, it just didn't, it didn't frighten me too much. What I loved about it was just the reveal that all of those lines in the photographs could be lined up to create that picture. Mm-hmm. I thought that, mm-hmm. that was that was wonderfully brilliant myself. I, I hadn't seen that before. But then again, I haven't watched much. So this is why Matt's really enjoying this show. He's sheltered and doesn't <laughs> doesn't get it much meat. Everything's yet. great. <laughs> All right. So now we have some. After that, we got a little bit inter, interpersonal stuff uh, because Letty's sister is like. Hey, uh, you know, <laughs> after we had all this trouble, everyone's leaving. Uh, we won't be able to pay for the place, and and uh, Letty let slip that uh, she's got still got some of the money that Mama left her. Rut row. Hmm. Tough. This is another thing that uh, I'm not sure why they have decided to kind of make this mysterious. Too, it still feels mysterious to me. Uh, we got maybe little hints, but mysterious to me why Letty and her mom, uh, had such a falling out. Huge falling out. They did. Letty didn't go to the funeral. Right. Letty uses a different last name. I mean, this is something big. It's its own Korea. You know, we have Korea for Tick and we have this story for Letty. Yeah. And so, uh, again, does, you know, we're, we're not criticizing, but do you, do you feel like you understand why? They're making the this to be a reveal, or do you feel like you know enough about about why they have the conflict that that you're not wondering why? No, I more? would. I don't know where the story's going, so this is an uneducated statement. But for me, it why not just tell me? Like Letty knows why, Ruby knows why there's an issue. It wasn't like with Tick where he wasn't sure where his father was. Or Tick, where at least they're giving me the impression this is something that really hurt him and he doesn't want to think about anymore, Korea. This, the characters know, but we as an audience don't. And so I'm sure it can be a powerful reveal when it comes up and then it'll make this entire sentences, (laughs) these sentences I'm saying sound stupid. But right now it just feels like emptiness that doesn't provide any nutrients to me in this show. Right. I mean, the one thing that's sort of different about uh, uh, this to 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 me as as for, as opposed to the Atticus Montrose storyline is, is that because of this other conflict, the people who are actually interacting, and that is Letty and his and her sister, uh, the the issue between them is blindingly clear why they're having a conflict, and yeah. for sure this comes up here. Uh, you know, she says she got that Mama left her money. Her sister says, first of all, why would she leave it to you? And second of all, mama didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, um, this one's going to leave a mark. Yeah. And they've always, in, in the little time we've seen them together, they have had a strained relationship, you can tell. And so what we keep hearing so much about this sister, how she wants to get a job at Marshall Fields. She wants to put in work and kind of build herself up that way. And so I, I like her as a character. I, once again, I, I think I just like the actress, really, because I, I don't feel like I, I have enough 
uh, meat on the bones. Once again, nutrients to really love the character. But I love this. I seem to like this actress so much because she's such a great singer and she has a good presence that in some ways it's papering over that. But in other ways, once again, uh, I keep being the bad guy. Listeners, apologies. I won't be on every podcast. Uh, that's all right. So uh, the next thing that we uh, deal with is uh, we're on day nine. That's when Madros meets up with, with Hippolyta. This is mm-hmm. when she says... I saw George's body and it doesn't match up with what you told me. That's kind of interesting. I I mean, really, you know, I'm not on Montrose's side much, but (laughs) I mean, if you were to kind of role play how that conversation would go, there's no way that conversation goes any way uh, that she's going to be happy with. He got shot by this cult, uh, uh, cult guy. Uh, we were attacked by Shoggoths. I mean, it really, I, I see no way in which this is going to be good information for her. Should we assume that George cheated on her and that's how Tick was born? Or do you think Tick was born before George was married? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously I think George cheated, was with her when Montrose was with her. Hmm. Okay. Which is why he's assumed that Montrose is his dad. But I didn't, I don't get the sense that they were together back then, that that was his, that was his love. And maybe he would have continued loving her, but she disappeared a long, long time ago. Maybe their affair went up right to the moment in which, until which she was gone. There's speculation, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what's not speculation is that we finally get to day 10, and we know day 10 is when everything is going down. Uh, Atticus finds uh, Letty at a bar. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is, again, this is the thing I appreciated. This is the kind of thing you see in typical horror movies or or other kind of movies where someone's like, look, I've gathered all this information, and she's she's disheveled, and it's crazy, and the person's like, I don't believe you at all, but Atticus is like, all right, run me through it. And uh, she has got enough uh, information uh, that uh, he believes that something is going down. Then they get into other things like uh, she tells him uh, that was my first time. (laughs) And then they talk about Artem. They're reminiscing about all kinds of things, Um, how she feels like kind of a ghost herself. I mean, it must be uh, disorienting for her to um, have uh, died and come back. Personally, I'm not, you know, I mean, we we only saw a few episodes before she died. Personally, to me, it doesn't seem like she's she's any different, but uh, that's a hell of a thing to have to go through. Walk it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk it <laughs> off. Oh. Walk it off. So, um, so they're like, yeah, they know somebody. You get a goat. You go back to your house in a, in a, in a posh neighborhood in the north side. Uh, you uh, cut its neck on the porch. Take some blood, put it on your forehead. And as they're going in, uh, Mm -hmm. we've got another thing happening. So this is this is where it's happening. I didn't quite in in a lot of the scenes we've had so far. I have felt as much fear about what's happening uh, with the uh, the human threat balanced with a supernatural threat but here i mm-hmm. i had no fear of the human threat whatsoever the well superna- the human threat the hu- two human f- sides meaning these three bastards who came in the house right and letty and tick they never interacted really if yeah, i understand correct they didn't but also i was not afraid that they were going to uh i don't know i never thought they would even end up catching up with them the uh the, the, one of my favorite parts of the episode happens when they go in and they hold hands and uh Everything in the room starts swirling around them, and it seems like horrible things are happening. And and someone someone yells out, "It's working!" <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "If this is working, I definitely do not want to see not working." Yeah. Then we have the moment where uh, the the uh, the white guys who come in they get accosted by uh, something which. Number one, I didn't understand, and number two, I found funny rather than scary, and that was something that Bubba referred to earlier was basketball man with baby head. (laughs) 
It's just nice that Carl Malone could come back. Oh, no, no. Carl Malone didn't have a small head. He had really short arms. Come on. Oh, okay. Who? Yeah. Well, all right. Now, who would it be? Who would it? Which NBA player would that really be representing? I, I don't have the. I, I don't. I've, I've, I've never seen anything like it before in my life, and I, and I did not find it uh, scary. Uh, but, but chalk one up for the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> the dangerous elevator uh, takes one of the dudes down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they think everything is uh, everything is fine, but the horrible, horrible ghost has an evil plan, and that oh. is, I'm going to give these guys a shower, and then they won't be safe anymore because the stuff will come off. And then what is then some of the scariest parts of the episode to me was. First, uh, the woman who is doing the uh, cleansing gets possessed, and then she touches Atticus, and he gets possessed, and then he walks forward, and it's flashing between him and the the, the guy who is doing all the experiments, yelling, "Get out of my house!" I found yeah, that, I thought that, I found I, that really creepy. Mm-hmm. The way the face kind of morphed from ticks to the to the white scientist creepy face. Yeah, oh, I, I thought yeah. great effect. And the way his body was really jerky, and it and it was it was really cool. So Letty calls on all the people in the house, the ghosts, the other ghosts that have been experimented on. And at first, when they join the circle, they're weak. Basketball man has baby head, and then as they start chanting more and more. Uh, they recover more of their bodies. Basketball man has regular sized head uh, and they exercise the ghost. Good work. It works. Really ex- Team, teamwork. Yeah. Really exciting. And then they don't. And then and then the house itself, as we said, ends up taking care of all the guys. So then uh, so then it's happy time again. People have moved into the house. We get a quick we get a quick recap by using this reporter to kind of uh, let us know everything that's happened, mm-hmm. um, that it's sort of she's bringing in, in now instead of artists, it's sort of kind of underprivileged people are, are moving into the house. Um, sh- the reporter asks her about, oh, the three white people, and Letty's like, never, I don't, white people, I don't, who, what, I don't know. Then they get off the elevator, and the elevator goes down, and hey, you know what? Did you know that there were uh, more floors to this uh this elevator goes way, way down. Love it. Keep going. I don't know how you, I don't know how what button you press to get it to go all the way down. But then uh, we see the white dudes. Oh, man. So who knows what's going on there? But we know, okay, there's a long tunnel. So something else is going on here. Holy cow. And then Atticus sees, Chris, sees first he sees the car across the street. Uh, there's a, a dentist office. Uh, when he goes in, uh, it looks we hear Christina is saying, "Oh, well, uh, the money's been wired to your account." See, she's 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 like uh, bought out the dentist so she can run a, a storefront. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, maybe she's going to sell spells and potions there. She's definitely not going to open up a restaurant. This actress looks like she's never eaten a thing in her life. <laughs> Yeah, maybe she's going to open up the first Weight Watchers in America. <laughs> this podcast does not endorse body shaming. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right, of all kinds. Is, right, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so uh, then Atticus says, oh, I figured out that the money actually came from you, <gasps> It was from you. Mm-hmm. He pulls out the gun. And he's like, stay away from his family. He all of a sudden then is kind of frozen. Uh, his Is face that what kind of move. Yeah, he. Because I thought I saw smoke. Like no. he pulled the tried to pull the trigger from the gun, but it it didn't. It the bullets no, just he disappeared. He was uh, he was un he was unable to pull the trigger. That that's what happened. Okay. And uh and then she opens up the uh, shade which he's closed, and yep. then she says, "Oh my God!" Uh, she she does give him some more information that her father had kind of an invulnerability spell. That, uh, you know, he had to, like, uh, give up uh, to do when he was doing the process. That's how he was able to be killed. She's learned one. You can learn only one spell, I think, is what she said. Mm. Um, yeah, she, you need more she, of this book of Adam to get some good spells. Right, to get some good spells. And she said, look, we learned all these great spells just from a few pages. So imagine if we had the whole book. And uh, then uh, she says, oh, my God. 
And what's amazing is she says, I thought you were smart. You would have sort of learned by now. What exactly does she say? You shouldn't pull a gun on a white woman. It's something like that. Mm. And I was like, oh, man. And then uh, she tucks a card in his pocket and leaves. So I don't. I don't know. Uh, maybe she's not going to open a Weight Watchers. Well, we know she can't. It, what was it? She can't be injured. Is that exactly what the spell is? I well, can't that's be what that seemed to no, uh, no. That's what she said. That's what she said that Adam slash Samuel had. I thought mm-hmm. maybe, and maybe I'm completely misinterpreted. I thought she was saying you could learn. You can learn one spell, and he learned that spell so he could be invulnerable. And I thought she was demonstrating by what she did to Atticus, the one spell that she has, which hmm. is she can immobilize somebody or create well, a force field, something that, like that. But Catfish wouldn't, if if he can't pull the trigger, doesn't that make her invulnerable also? Well, yeah, to her, but if she goes outside and somebody hits her uh, with a car, I think she's not invulnerable. Now, thinking of what she did here, and what's happened before, maybe her spell is that force field spell. That she she is the one who used the spell that stopped the car. She's able to stop him from being able to move. Mm-hmm. So, again, I could be completely wrong, but I thought that they'd said, you know, one spell per customer. Well, I thought it was, and let me say, I probably am 100% wrong. I thought it was, we only have one spell because we need more of this book. We get this book, think of all the awesome spells we could do. Okay. That's the way I took it. All right. Well, well, you know what we need to do? We need to have people vote on the poll. And you know what the, the benefit of people being voted on the poll is? They can go back and watch and tell me that I was wrong. Hey. All right. Well, so that is this week's episode. And again, not to sort of cheat or anything, But there are eight interconnected stories in the book. And Mm -hmm. by all appearances, we are um, hitting a completely different story of the week next week. Mm. So, again, we will there's there's a through line going on here, but we will find ourselves in different creepy, disturbing circumstances next week. Especially if we're going to Florida, it'll all be creepy. Oh, man. (laughs) Or Jack Jacksonville, Florida. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, as we all know, what we like to do on this show, besides our doubles and reading viewer mail, is we like to well, sometimes we like to play some games on the yeah. show, keep things light and interesting. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do some. Each person is going to uh, ask a question and we will debate this question. Feel free, again, to send us your answers on this question. So, Matt, do you do you want to uh, introduce the first debate topic? Well, in tribute to our previous coverage of Babylon Berlin, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to propose a, a version of who's the worst. And I, I'm going to say these three circumstances, and then everybody picks a side and argues that side emphatically. Sure. All right, all right, Matt. The only thing I'll say is let's let's keep it light. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Have it. Let, let's have it to be a nice light question. Let's yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, light question for you. What's the worst? Letting your brother get beat by your father. That's nice and light. How about having an affair with your brother's wife? That's okay. light also. Mm-hmm, How mm-hmm. about letting your brother beat his boy, who may actually be your boy? Thanks to the previously mentioned affair. Wow. Which, which argument yeah, yeah. of these light subjects would you like to tackle, Catfish? They're all ripe for comedy. <laughs> they, really, they really are. Uh, you know, I, uh, yeah. I, I'm trying to figure out which of, these, which of these subjects I can joke about the most. Oh, my God. I, I, I think uh, the worst uh, has to be letting a, a grown man... Uh, beat a child regardless of whether they are your child actually your child or not and in fact even if you're guilty because you think it might be your child i think that's the worst no 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 that is not the worst okay tell me that that's a sure sign you're lazy you're letting your you know you're shipping out your own child beating to somebody else Get in there and do it yourself. If it's your kid, you beat them. Those are the rules. So I think what the worst is, oh 
<laughs> is letting your brother yeah. get beat get beat by your father. Why do I think that is the worst? Uh-huh. Well, I think it's the worst is because what do we know about fathers? They're old. They're prone to heart attacks. And letting your brother get beat by your father mm-hmm. is a sure way to give old Paul a heart attack. So that's why you do it as a family. You get mom in there, granny, and you all beat the brother together. Got it. You do it yourself. You chip in. <laughs> your, right. your complaint is that when you do that, it's not a fair distribution of work. Not at all. Okay. All right, Matt. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm go, left, Matt. Uh-huh. I've, I've got the leftovers here. Uh, uh-huh. Having an affair with your brother's wife okay. is, big deal. is big the deal. worst. Nah. Okay. Why? Well, it's simply the worst because your brother is not the person who is going to come back at you and make sure that you get killed. It's the wife, depending on how well you perform. Hold on. That's what, Matt, that's exactly where I was going. This isn't the worst. How often do we know that uh, husbands and wives have trouble, marriage difficulties? What is it? A third of marriages end in divorce? Got it. And so anything you can do to keep your brother's wife happy, he keeps their marriage strong, less likely to get a divorce. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? I got to say, I'm just, I mean, I had my own opinions on this, but I'm completely swayed by Bubba's like dedication to family here. He's all about family (laughs) togetherness. Um, You know, he's from the South. The families, families stay together. No, families are, families are tight in the South. Um, all right. So here's my question. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, for the longest time I was a renter. And so mm-hmm. whatever, whatever happens to the place, whatever's happening across the street, whatever's happened next door, wh- whoever's parking in front of my apartment, I don't give a rat's ass. But now no. I'm a homeowner. And oh. so now like people have a party and like it's like 10 05 i might call the cops if it's still loud you if someone bastard. parks in front of my house oh, i'm like who's parking in front of my house all right so my question to you is irrespective of race and you have to ignore the cross burning okay but irrespective of race what is the worst neighbor behavior is it Putting bricks on your car horns so that there's constant honking or, okay. or or having a huge, huge house party and then killing a goat on your doorstep. What is the worst neighbor behavior? Now, I just have to understand some things. So I was I'm the neighbor. And so the so it's either neighbors, you know, blaring their horn 24 seven or Neighbors having a loud party and slaughtering an animal. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and, and by the way, they have that loud party like three days after they move in. So mm-hmm. you have to say to yourself, is this a one off or is this going to be regular? Well, I think it's obviously uh-huh. the loud party because as a neighbor, I wasn't invited. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Where was yeah. my invite? <laughs> I am going to go I'm going to go for the goat because I oh. am a big supporter of pita and that just doesn't seem right. Yeah, goat in a pita is delicious. Oh wait, oh sorry, you meant. <laughs> <laughs> Goatsy. All right, well we got one more uh Bubba. Do you do you want to or do you want to do you want to you want to go off the board here or do you want Of course. Uh, of course. Yeah, okay. You ready? Yeah. So you guys you guys tell me, you know, because a lot of things are terrible. We're we're living in this for everybody listening in the future, this is the pandemic of 2020. So many things are terrible. All right. So what is the worst? I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> People, we have, we, you know what? I've made some terrible jokes in this little silly games we've been playing. Everybody's, we're trying to be light and fun on a show where there's this her- horrific history of racism in our country that's being displayed in the show so brilliantly. And so when we're talking about what's worse and we want to be light and fun, we really, really have to be specific in the sins of the episode. And so what is worse, drying your cups face up or face down? Mm. You know, I'm torn on this simply because I feel like if you dry your cups face down, you could actually trap the moisture in there, mm-hmm. and then it could get like moldy. 
But right. if you dry it face up, the wa- it may never dry, and then I don't. I it's I it's just a tough one for me. I'm gonna have to say face. I'd say it's worse to dry your cups face up. It's that's double a tough M one for me. Well, I'm gonna have to go face down simply oh. for the fact that I'm anti gravity. Well, what's great is I didn't tell you guys whichever way you picked. That's which way you're going to be facing when the elevator hits you into decapitates you. <laughs> <laughs> face up, face down, either way. Oh man, you're getting it. Yeah, well, I and that's and and depending on which way the elevator is going, that's which way your face is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way to dry it. The only way to dry it. Uh, all right, and so since we Matt Murdock is the brains behind this podcast, of course we have to do. The oldest game of all, which is three oh, yeah. words, a three word description of the episode. Matt, the father of this of this game, of this this thing. Mm-hmm. What are your three words? My three words this time around is that's a ghost. Uh, because mm-hmm. a lot of the uh, as you referenced our basketball player, our baby basketball player, uh there there's kinds of things in this that I did not find uh scary or compelling but uh i did uh enjoy the overall just them trying i guess i'll just put it that way or uh, what about you bubba your three word description of the episode what was the real scary thing the thing that scared all of us in this episode obviously mortgages and so when you buy a new house and you have to pay that first down payment that's scary. So my three little words are, this house, scary. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, I didn't think anybody could do worse than me, Bubba, but you actually did. <laughs> I was going to say, like, I was going to say, like, I don't think mine are any good, but now I don't need to worry about following that. All right. My three words are. In honor of the Black Kraken bringing up Bill Belichick. Oh, yeah. Uh, my three words are to the next. And uh, that is to the next storyline next week. On to the next. Uh, this was this was good, but I'm 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 hopeful about the future. And I'm hoping that in the end, this is kind of one of one of the one of the weaker episodes as far as uh I mean, there were some amazing things in it, but mm-hmm. as far as the combination of the two fears, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for for more uh, m- more more scares. Well, maybe this is a good time to introduce just a little bit of Double B. Double, Double B. B. Book bitching, catfish. This isn't a question that you have to spoil anything on or whatever, but uh, of these interconnected stories that you keep speaking of that I have no knowledge of whatsoever. Was this one one of the weaker ones to read? Was this one even in the book? Now, see, now now I have to push back. Now, I was very clear. I was very clear if you're listening to me very carefully in the first episode. Okay. I was very clear that I did read this book. Okay. All right. Did, Thank you. Did I at any point say that I either reread it recently or I remembered very well what happened in the book? No, I didn't say either of those things. So a very careful listen to what I said was, yes, I read this book, but I have not shared any special uh, insights from the book. You have uh, because Because I did not reread it before we started this No podcast. insight. <laughs> no, no insights. So, so you're pleading the fifth. That's fine with me. No, I'm telling you exactly uh, I don't, <laughs> that I may or may not have gone onto Wikipedia earlier tonight and gone, oh, yeah, that's right. They were eight interconnected stories. <laughs> I would say you can't get that insight on other podcasts, but there wasn't any insight. So it's... <laughs> like... <laughs> well, let's just real quick talk about the music. If oh, yeah. All right, let's, let's do, do it. it. Because there were some there were some great cuts from that Liza Richardson, the music supervisor, put together throughout this episode. And I, I just want to point this out. Uh, right after I list these off, we're going to do our own drop the needle selections. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to take a look at the theme that we heard at the end when Christina showed up, which will make my review of that particular theme 
I sound very naive because I re- pre-recorded it on Friday night. Hmm. Uh, but we did hear a reappearance of that theme, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we had, uh, as we talked about earlier, the Hele uh, was in there at the very beginning mm-hmm. during the funeral. Yep. Uh, while in the kitchen, we had Fats Domino doing Ain't That a Shame. Oh, yeah. When Montrose uh, gave Tick his answer about whether he could stay or not, he chose uh, Stanchen, which is a German song by Marian Anderson and Franz Rupp. Uh, God's been good to me, which I love that. That was when Letty was moving people in, moving people around and into the house uh, by the Mighty Walker Brothers. Uh, Boogie at Midnight was one of the tunes that uh, Ruby was singing. Uh, that's Wound Me. Musaku, who was singing that, great job. Uh, we heard a version of Good Rockin' Daddy by Eddie James, probably my one kind of grit moment because that song wouldn't have been out yet at that time, I don't think. Um, is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby uh, was done. That's a wonderful old standard. Again, Wound Me was doing that one. I Don't Hurt Anymore by Dinah Washington, which I'm not sure of how when that was put out, so I'm not real sure about that one. Take It Back by Dorinda Clark Cole, and Satan, We Gonna Tear Your Kingdom Down during the exorcism. Uh, that was by Shirley Caesar. I thought that was very powerful as well. But Bubba, I want to ask you, yeah. if you had to pick any one of those songs, did you have a favorite that stuck out to you, something that got your toe a little tapping? Well, that that is kind of two different questions, man. So stuck out to me and toe a tapping, that's Domino. That's a classic. I've heard it so much in my life because my dad is such a huge fan of it. And so that's the one that got my toe a tapping. But I love it anytime she sings. I love it anytime Ruby sings. And so both of those were my high points. I love it. She's got a great voice. How about you, Catfish? Well, you, you know, this is funny here because, uh, again, I didn't enjoy the episode as much as I've enjoyed the first two was the needle drops. I mean, we talk about needle drops, you usually think of music, but there's been a lot of spoken word stuff on mm-hmm. here. And those are the needle drops I've enjoyed. The James Baldwin uh, debate uh, with William F. Buckley in in episode one, uh, the Gil Scott Heron spoken word in episode two, and so there wasn't really there wasn't really any of that tonight for me. I mean, I know the thing that kind of stood out was the commercial by I would love to have you try her name again, but uh, we don't have time. Um, Please no. So, um, Please no. By uh, Laomi Maldonado. Um, but I would say, uh, so I'd like more of that, but so f- I'm just going to go with Satan. We're going to tear your kingdom down. Cause, cause I just thought that was, that's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome song. That was really powerful. I love the God's been good to me uh, by the mighty Walker brothers. To me, it. As Letty's getting moved in and everything, it seemed really appropriate with all of the joy that is in that song. Nice. nice. All right. Listeners, we want to know what your favorite song was. Write to us at Double PHQ on Twitter, Instagram. Go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash at Double PHQ. That's the word double, single letter P, then letters HQ for headquarters. Heck, if you're listening to this on YouTube, give us a YouTube comment. Give us the thumbs up. We want to hear from you. You are the fourth member. You are the ghost that is possessing us as we talk about this great show. Oh, yeah. And here's a look at the theme. If you aren't into the score of this show or you don't want to know about it, skip ahead about 17 minutes. But we're going to take a look at a theme that we've heard through all three episodes now. Mr. Freeman. The Elder, Mr. Freeman. We've been expecting you, Mr. Freeman. Welcome home. Man, that is some brilliant insight. And I really have three words to describe that uh, 17-minute section you just did on this score, Matt. And those three words are, this how scary. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the podcast of apologies continues uh we'll go into next week uh, as i apologize for that long segment they won't be that long that next time this is an extraordinarily long podcast as well oh yeah oh, well it's it was so good to get the band back together hopefully we can uh 
we can uh, chain uh, Bubba uh, to something down in the basement, and he will be back with us oh, yeah. next week. But until then, first of all, mm-hmm. reach out to us. Yeah. Matt, how can people get to you? I'm at Musical Concepts on Twitter, and that's where you can find the polls, and maybe if Double P uh, retweets them as well. Heck and, yeah. and Bubba, what about you? How can they reach you? You can find me, Bubba, on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F I T T E N T R I M, at Fit and Trim on Twitter. Yeah, and on Twitter, you can hit me up, catfish at CJGman67. Remember, leave a written review yep. or use hashtag Shaga Surprise mm-hmm. in a tweet, and you will be entered to win you a Cthulhu Funko Pop pot out of my own proceeds from our voluminous ad revenue love it but we will talk to you next week on shock and surprise i mean i don't he sounds like a child molester yeah i do this how scary It's Catfish. What's really important for our podcast is we like to share listener feedback. We like to be told if we're wrong. It's double M. Please reach out to us. Tell us why Catfish is wrong. Two wonderful panelists. Double, 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 double P podcast. Double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P. What I like to call. Double, double, double P podcast.